Hello everyone, my name is Susan DeBleek and I'm the program assistant for the statewide Iowa Master Gardener program and I wanted to welcome you today to the third growing season webcast. Today is the third part of a three-part series. You've got to learn about how to plant for the shade, how to diagnose some tree problems, and now we're on to insects. So today, Nathan Brockman from Ryman Gardens is going to be presenting to you on What's the Buzz About? That'll be a 90-minute presentation. We'll take a short break for a discussion, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Laura Jesse about diagnostic tips. A couple things we have for you today. We do have a worksheet so you can keep track of this list of insects that we're going to be talking to through today. Also, we have an evaluation form. Please fill it out and hand it back to your Extension County staff and they will send it in. Also, I wanted to encourage you to log your continuing education hours. If you log on to our volunteer reporting system, and if you're a master gardener, please feel free to enter two continuing education hours in for this workshop. All right, I will hand it over to Nathan Brockman, who is the butterfly wing curator for Ryman Gardens. Hello and welcome to What's All That Buzz About? My name's Nathan Brockman and I am the Butterfly Wing Curator at Ryman Gardens. And today we're going to talk about insects and why they're so amazing and fascinating and why you as Master Gardener should be outside paying attention to them. So we're going to start here with this, uh, this map. Bison is a new program by USGS where they're starting to gather all the different species information for mammals, invertebrates, birds, everybody that they can and try to put it into a large centralized database. And one day I was testing out bison and I just typed in the scientific name for the swallowtail butterflies, which is Papilio. And I ran the map and as you can see here, they have records of information from every state except Iowa. And <laughs> it's really kind of a sad thing. I mean, in Iowa, we have several species of swallowtails. We've got the black swallowtail, the giant swallowtail, the tiger swallowtail, and on occasions you'll find a zebra swallowtail, a pipe vine, and a spice bush swallowtail. And to have not a single record from any of the databases they pulled in really said something about data being collected from the state currently. So today I'm going to talk to you about the different insects we have in the state. I don't have time to talk about every single individual, but I'll try to cover the major groups at least, and then some more specifically with fun information, and a bit of how you can get involved and excited about the insects that are in your backyard. Now if you've never been on bugguide.net, it is one of the web pages that you need to go to. Bugguide.net was initially started by a hobbyist. He had some insect photos, he wanted to share them with others, get some identified, so he created Bugguide. And it became so popular and so overwhelming that he couldn't handle the traffic anymore. And Iowa State University's um, Department of Entomology stepped in and they took over the website, um, the management, the operations, the programming, all the, the pieces that go with it. But it's a wonderful, wonderful spot on the web where you can go and post photos of insects you know or don't know that you may want identification from, and other individuals in the community will respond back to you. And they'll give you information about the individual, what it is, or at least point you in the right direction. Uh, it's wonderful. The community is built up of, you know, brand new individuals, hobbyists, enthusiasts, uh, professionals and and researchers so you can be posting something and have the leading expert from Germany respond to your post uh, so it's a wonderful wonderful resource and a place where you can go to learn those insects in your backyard or encourage youth to go here um, it's a nice friendly community uh, where kids can get involved with identifying the insects that they find in their backyards and they do more than just insects too, as you can see at the bottom of the kind of pictograph on the left there, they've got millipedes and spiders and centipedes and scorpions and ticks, and so they expand past uh, the, in the insects as well into other invertebrates. So it's a great, great community. So today what we're going to do is we're going to work our way through the insect orders. And I've got this uh, tree here 
of how insects are divided up into their separate orders. Now this is a, a bit of an older image. It's funny over time scientists are always uh, either splitting or l lumping together and and this uh, definitely has some areas that are, are lumped together in this this version here. Uh, grasshoppers and praying mantises and cockroaches they would all be you know split off into their own groups nowadays they would not be lumped together like they are on, on this particular map but you can kind of follow along we're gonna start at the bottom of the the tree here and crawl all the way up to the top and we'll end with bees at the very end so you'll know where we're at uh, there'll be a little pictograph of this in the the bottom right corner on every slide with an arrow of where we're at uh, so you kinda of see the progression as we move our way up through the tree so we're gonna start off today with mayflies and mayflies are a lot of fun. Um, I grew up in, in Fort Madison, Iowa, so down there in the southeast corner of the state. Uh, I grew up knowing exactly what mayflies were. Uh, being along a river town, some years when they come emerging out, um, it is just crazy. Uh, I remember as a kid one time the, uh, the bridge that goes across the Mississippi there in Fort Madison, the railroad bridge, um, they had to get out the snow plows and actually snow plow the mayflies off because they were causing the bridge to be too slippery for the uh, cars that were passing over. Um, so what's great about this individual is, is one, they're an aquatic um, naiad. So as they're underwater, their immature stage is aquatic, feeds lots and lots of fish. Um, <laughs> they're a lot of fun uh, because fishermen always want to know how the mayflies are doing to how well they'll be doing with their fishing uh, but then once a year as adults they emerge out of the water and they fly around they have a very very short lifespan um, you know day is typically what they're accounted to there's even um, a species at least one species that's known to only live about an hour as adults uh, so these aren't a pest. When you see them, they're a bit of a nuisance. When they're in large, large numbers, they're flying around um, lights. They're covering the streets, um, not harming anything in your garden. Again, you'll be sweeping them up, and they'll be gone in no time at all. So fun bit of a story is, is they have this very short lifespan as adults. Again, the immature stage lives much longer, but as adults, they don't live very long. Uh, and they're not doing much. They're, they're just finding a mate. Uh, the females are laying their eggs again, and then off they go. So kind of keeping with the, uh, the aquatic immatures, we've got our damselflies. Uh, damselflies are a wonderful individual. Uh, damselflies are predators. So they're up eating, you know, potential mosquitoes or other pests that we wouldn't like. Again, they have an aquatic uh, immature. Uh, and in this image right here, you can actually see this one is eating a mosquito. Uh, when I took this shot, I was out in a really wooded area, and it had a had a f s slow moving stream. Uh, and this is the ebony jewel wing, and they the the immatures would live in that uh, water source. Uh, but I was getting just eaten up by mosquitoes, and I was taking pictures of different insects in the area. And lo and behold, I found this one here chewing on a mosquito, and I couldn't help but be happy to see that it was just uh, devouring this mosquito. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Damselflies are typically a smaller insect, slender body, and when they're sitting at rest, they like to keep their wings up behind their backs. There are some that will sit with their wings spread, but a lot of times damselflies are known for being individuals that sit with their wings up and back. Uh, unlike their counter, their closely related counterpart, which is the dragonflies. Dragonflies typically sit with their wings spread. Again, this is another aerial predator. Um, if you're out gardening and you see dragonflies zipping around, damselflies zipping around, you should be excited to see them. Uh, they're essentially working for you, taking out the flying flies and other small insects that are above your head and they're extremely strong flyers so even though your yard might not be by a water source uh, the adults will fly a decent distance away from water sources in search of large flying insect populations again when these are at rest typically with their wings spread uh, they don't really have the ability to pull their wings back uh, and it's always fun when you're looking at dragonflies and damselflies with kids to, to really look at their faces. They have really, really fascinating faces. Uh, their eyes alone are, are extremely impressive. And this is one of the groups that it's really easy to get involved with. 
Uh, we actually have a wonderful, wonderful resource here in the state, uh, which is the Iowa Odinate Survey. And it's a, it's a website that you can go to, and they've got lists of where the different species of dragonflies have been found in the state. Um, so you can get yourself a checklist. Uh, you can report species that you have observed on there. Uh, take a pictures, you can send them in. Um, and it's got a really vibrant community. So for those of you that are water gardeners, um, especially, this might be one that you're interested in, and especially if you have a decent sized pond. Another resource that you can get involved with, whether or not you have your own pond or you want to go out and you like to just walk around and survey insects, is this Migratory Dragonfly Partnership. And what this group does is they train citizen scientists to go out and monitor dragonfly populations in the wild. Uh, so you have a, a set protocol that you would do, which is basically a, a set walk that you would take. You walk around the pond, and as you're walking, you have a viewing radius, and you record all of the dragonfly species that you know. Now, even if you don't know all your dragonfly species right away, they help you learn. And as I mentioned from this previous slide, you can go on here and get checklists, and there's lots of identification tools on here as well that you can use. And, and you can quickly learn the dragonflies that you will find. Uh, it's a bit easier to do these dragonfly surveys than butterflies because you just have less potential species that you need to learn initially. Uh, so they're, they're a great uh, individual to survey. They're a good indicator species because they tell us how the ponds are doing in the area because if the water quality is good, then the dragonflies should be doing good in those ponds as well. So stepping away from those Aerial predators to, to something people don't normally want to see is termites. And, and yes, termites uh, do feed on wood, so they get a bad rap for being a house destroyer. Um, the Formosan termites, especially, uh, that are more in the southern part of the U.S., get more credit for being uh, rougher on structures like that. But termites feed on wood. When out in their natural setting, termites are a wonderful thing. They help us decompose and break down trees that have fallen down. So they're, they're a good guy. Uh, they get a bad rap, uh, but, but they do serve a good purpose for us. Now, termites and ants confuse people a bit. Um, we're going to look at ants kind of near the end of this. But notice here how the body form all kind of melds together. Uh, where the thorax and abdomen come together, it's a large piece. There. On the ants, it's going to come to a narrow kind of waist. Um, it won't have the large connection that you see there on the, uh, on the termites. And, and, and again, yes, you don't want termites in your house uh, because when they feed, they break down the wood in such a way that it could become structurally um, unacceptable, uh, but in the wild, they're really good at breaking down our trees, and we need them out there. Uh, they are good guys, and they're really fun to watch. If you've ever broken up an old log that had termites in it and, and to kind of watch what they've done to that wood, um, it's fascinating to see that they can just strip out all those pieces, but keep it in such a way that they can continue to roll through it without it collapsing on top of them. Earwigs. Earwigs are a, another fun group. Um, there's a lot of lore with earwigs. Uh, again, these are more decomposers. They're, they're not bad insects. They're good guys. Uh, they're breaking down organic waste. You find them when you're flipping over rocks or you're moving through some of the leaf litter in your gardens. Uh, they're, they're just hanging out. And, and yes, at the end of their thorax or at the end of their abdomen, they do have those really interesting looking pincers down there, um, but they're not going to harm you with those. Um, you could stick your finger there, they might try and close them, but it is not going to, to hurt at all. Uh, again, kind of the, the, the lore is that they'll crawl in your ears or they'll be in the wigs. Um, again, if it's organic matter from the old wigs that people would have worn historically, um, you know, that you think of with politicians, um, yeah, they might go for a substance like that. But, but earwigs are, are a good guy. Um, if you see them in your gardens, um, they're not harming anything. They aren't going to attack you. Um, again, they're, they're fun to watch as they scurry around and try and look tough. 
with those large pincers at the end of their abdomens. So up into walking sticks now. Walking sticks are a lot of fun. They look like sticks. Um, these guys are wonderful at camouflage. And uh, because they blend in with sticks. And we have a decent number of species that live here in the state. Uh, growing up as a kid, uh, near our driveway, there was a burning bush. And for whatever reason, they really loved it. And almost... On an annual basis, I could go out there um, every year and I could find some individuals that were feeding on it. And, and they quickly became one of my favorite insects to play with as a kid. Extremely docile. Um, they can't hurt anyone at all. They're a great insect to kind of teach kids on because they're extremely slow moving. I mean, if you're an insect that your main defense is to look like a branch you're not going to be a fast mover. Uh, and it's fun because they like to sway like they're in the wind being blown. So as they think they're disturbed, they'll, they'll kind of walk on you and sway back and forth. Um, again, not going to harm anyone. They're wonderful to play with when you can find them crawling in some of your bushes or trees or if they've crawled onto your house uh, late in the fall to kind of warm up. Uh, fascinating fascinating individuals now I have here a picture of their eggs uh, their eggs are extremely hard to find when they lay them usually they're laid on the ground kind of in the leaf litter areas and when they hatch out you get these tiny tiny little bitty walking sticks that'll crawl up onto the plants and feed on the leaves they don't do enough damage to, to harm the plants even yes they're feeding on the leaves but they eat so so little you don't even recognize that they're there sometimes the only reason that you notice that they're there is you see a little of their frass frass is the really you know it's the fancy term for insect poop essentially but you'll come along and you'll see a leaf that has a large number of black circles on it. Um, that's the frass. And you won't even know the leaves that are being chewed on. And as you follow it up, you'll eventually find what will most likely be one of the, the later in stars, the largest sizes, the adult. Um, because before that, the frass is so small, you don't even recognize the frass is in the area. Um, but it is always fun. Uh, I've raised several species of walking sticks now, and when they first come out of their eggs, they have to kind of pull their body up out of the eggs, stretch all big, stretching their legs as far as they can before their exoskeletons harden, and then they're ready to go, and they're off and running. Now, I probably have to thank this insect here, the praying mantis, for me being an entomologist. Um, these are one of my favorite insects. And as you'll see at the end of the talk, my email address is mantis, and then my initials, nb, at iastate.edu. So I have to account a lot of me being an entomologist to praying mantises. They are quite possibly, for kids, especially one of the most amazing insects to watch. Uh, here in Iowa, we have the Chinese mantid. Uh, it is a large praying mantis. Uh, it's one that gets shipped around a lot, used in biocontrol, and we'll talk a bit more of that in a minute. Uh, but as a kid, growing up in southeast Iowa, there would be decent populations of these. And I could go out in the fall and find praying mantises sitting on people's homes. Uh, as we're out and about at ball games with the lights on, you'd see them flying around in the stadiums. Uh, they are a large, large insect, and one that you can really kind of play with. Uh, they're, they're tough enough, they're strong enough that you can hold them in your hands, you can pick them up and move them, um, and they make a great pet, uh, especially for kids, because they will eat for you. They will literally take the food right out of your hands. They have a fascinating life history. So up in the top left, you can see the Othika. The Othika is the egg case that the praying mantis lays. The Othika is essentially like that foam material that you, that spray foam you can get in a can. That's exactly what it feels like. And packed in there is over a hundred of the praying mantis's eggs. 
So they would lay this sticky foam Otheka on a surface, on a wall, it would dry and harden, and then out of it would come, as you can see in the bottom right, I've got two tubes filled with Othekas that are currently emerging. And the praying mantises just kind of rain out of it. Um, you can see they're hanging from each other as they're coming down. It's a really good idea if you have a bunch of praying mantises in a container like that to get them out really quick and spread them out uh, because they will eat each other. But as I mentioned, they're fun to watch eat. As you can see in the bottom left, we've got the praying mantis there that is eating a grasshopper. So when I get to grasshoppers in just a second, praying mantises are good guys. They're going to eat those pest species that you're not wanting around in your gardens. And yes, you can buy praying mantis othecas in garden catalogs. They'll send you like three praying mantis othecas. The trick is when you put them out in your gardens, you know, a lot of them are going to end up eating each other because they just don't have enough food right away. So if you are going to do something like this, you want to really emerge them out in some sort of container or something and then quickly spread them all over your yard so they're not competing with each other. They are a generalist, however, and they will eat everybody, even the insects that you want in your yard. So kind of keep that in mind. Lots of them, they'll eat everything, including butterfly caterpillars that you might want so that you can see the butterflies flying around later. And then into the grasshoppers. So grasshoppers are exactly the same as locusts. Locusts are grasshoppers. They are the same thing. Um, yes, grasshoppers are a pest, when, especially in large numbers. They will eat large amounts of, of leaf matter, but, but they're not really bad guys if, if they're in lower numbers. Um, they're a lot of fun to watch, especially as they become adults and they get wings. Um, they're strong jumpers. Um, and, and they're a great one for kids to play with because you can pick them up, you can move them, uh, you can actually watch them use their strong jumping legs to jump long distances. And then again, if you have adults, watch them jump and fly. So see how insects move. Um, one of the reasons insects are such a successful species or group of insects is because a lot of them have wings as adults, allowing them to disperse and move long distances. And it's really a lot of fun to watch them go about their daily behaviors and to move. Now, like a lot of these other ones we've been talking about so far, the immatures of these, the nymphs, uh, they look exactly the same as the adults. They don't have wings, and they're not reproductive. For a grasshopper to be an adult, it doesn't just have to be large, because there are some tiny species of grasshoppers that never get large. Um, but you can tell that they're an adult because they have wings. If they don't have wings yet, then they're not an adult. Now, closely related to our grasshoppers are our katydids. Uh, essentially, same general body layouts. Uh, the big thing comes from their wing structures. Katydids are another species that is wonderful, wonderful at camouflage. They blend in really well with their surroundings. And some of them have wing structures that even make them look like they have dead leaves on their backs um, or they blend in and they look just like a leaf and they behave in such a way as they're sitting feeding on leaves that they look like the very leaves that they're sitting on. Um, not as big a jumpers as the grasshoppers uh, but but another large large species with with these wonderful wings. Kind of in the same boat still we have our crickets. Crickets are another one of those that kind of get a bad rap because they accidentally find their way into your home. And then you hear them chirp, chirp, chirping away as they're trying to communicate with each other. Uh, that's one of the things insects needs to do is communicate. And uh, this particular group especially is good at, at using an acoustical communication form. Uh, there are lots of different species of crickets. Uh, only a couple species find their way into homes accidentally and kind of hang out in basements. Um, all you need to do is pick them up, take them back outside, and they won't be a problem anymore. Crickets are a good kind of feeder insect. Uh, they're one of the insects that is currently used a lot in the pet trade to feed snakes and lizards and other insects. And they're also one of the insects that's being currently looked at a lot for human consumption. Uh, they're using it a lot now 
in uh, power flower and some of those other things because insects as a food source not only for other mammals besides us um, and other invertebrates uh, but insects are a good food source for humans and currently a lot of work is being done with mealworms wax worms and crickets because they can raise them in large large volumes and and they are starting to be used as food items they're high in protein low in fat and the conversion from say a grain source to raising uh, a pound of crickets is a lot more efficient than if you use that same grain conversion to raise say a pound of beef so in the future look forward to more insects on your plate I know it's weirding some of you out but in other countries right now insects are used as a delicacy and the United States is one of the last places to truly pick it up as a as a food source so I've got two more crickets these are a little less common than what you're gonna see but I think they're so blasted cute that I couldn't talk about these uh, specialty crickets here. So these are mole crickets. And as the name implies, they're a ground dweller. They crawl through the ground. Um, and they do kind of look like a mole. And they have these large fossorial digging legs that they use to burrow underground. Uh, they're a wonderful species. They they look something very sci-fi that a scientist threw together in its his mad lab or her mad lab, um, and then released into the environment. Uh, but you know, it's just an individual that evolved in such a way that it had the structures it needed in order for it to you know, move through its environment. And then finally, I have a cricket that you're probably not going to see here in Iowa. Um, they're, they're more of a southern species or more out west, but they're just so blasted cute I couldn't help but put them into my PowerPoint. Uh, this is the Jerusalem cricket. And apparently at one point in time when people got excited, they would just go, Jerusalem! So this cricket used to weird people out, and uh, they now call it the Jerusalem cricket. And they have these very funny kind of faces when you hold them in your hand and you look at them in the face they almost look like they have kind of this baby face to them uh, they're just also so large and not so much clumsy but a, a very bulky mover um, so it's really fun to, to watch them move through their environment and and just kind of turn and stare at you it, it's like you're you're looking almost into a human face when you look at these these crickets. Now, to make everyone comfortable with this group, I did actually throw in a picture of a dead cockroach because for most people, the only good cockroach is a dead cockroach. But that's not really the case. Again, there are lots of different species of cockroaches. Most of them stay outside and they serve a very important purpose, breaking down, you know, organic matter. They're good guys. Um, yes, we have the uh, the American cockroach, what gets in home. German cockroaches, occasionally the Oriental cockroaches. Um, they're more manufacturing usually and in sewer drain sort of areas. You know, none of them live in very pleasant places typically. But there are many more species than those. That's a very tiny, tiny percentage of all the cockroaches found in the world. Most of them are not structural pests. They're outside. They're going about their their lives, you know, serving a purpose, um, breaking down organic matter, and being part of the food chain. There again, they're another good one that a lot of mammals and birds will feed on um, quite well. So while yes, I did throw in a, a dead cockroach for you um, to 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 uh, make everyone excited that uh, no no live cockroaches were on board. Um, they're good guys, and and I realize you don't want them in your houses. Um, so controlling cockroaches is okay, but just know that, that just because there's a couple of bad apples in the group, that not all cockroaches are bad. Now thrips, and thrips is always said with an S, and it's not because there is always more than one on your plants. Um, it's just always said with an S. Thrips are a pest, and if you don't want to like them, that's okay. 
I'm, I'm having a hard time coming up with a good reason that you should like thrips because, yes, if you have these on your plants, these tiny, tiny little insects are feeding on them and they're draining a bit of the nutrients away. And you can tell when you have thrips, especially high populations of thrips on your plants um, because you start getting the, the discolorations on, on the leaves. Uh, thrips can be very hard to identify. Again, they're very tiny insects. This is one of those insects that you going out and getting yourself a good hand lens or a, a nice big magnifying glass so that as you're flipping leaves over, you can look at them. Um, you can look in the heads of your flowers. Oftentimes, that's where a lot of them are. If you have a large bloom and you kind of run your fingers through it and you see tiny little things scurrying up out of the, the flower head, there is a good chance you have a large population of thrips hanging in there. Uh, so some control may be needed for these little buggers because um, they will cause some plant damage. Now, finally into bugs. Now, I am a big advocate of calling animals their appropriate names. And most insects are not bugs. They are insects. But there is a group of insects that are called the true bugs. And true bugs have a piercing sucking mouth part and they feed on a variety of things they don't have to all be plant feeders but a lot of them are um, but there are predators in this group as well so what are some examples of some true bugs well we have our stink bug which is the individual on the left there or the shield bug they also get called because they look like a shield uh, they are plant pest and then we have our leaf footed bugs or squash bugs, which would be an example, would be the one on the right there. Both of those individuals do feed on plants. Your shield bugs, um, more typically on like the fruiting heads, so you're going to get some funny shaped fruits from them, where the other one would actually be sucking from the plant itself. Only when they're in large numbers do they cause real damage. Um, most of the time, you see a couple here and there. You can flick them off your plants or just leave them be and let one of your beneficials, like your praying mantises or some of those other good guys that are out there, just eat them for you. So let's move into the good guys. I'm going to get away from, from the ones that, that everyone doesn't like, and we'll talk about some of the fun, fascinating ones that are our good guys working for us out there. So the ambush bug, again, ambush, as the name implies, um, is hunting for prey. And this one here you can see has actually grabbed itself a butterfly. So while you want the butterfly, um, they need to eat like everyone else. And they don't, because they're fairly generalist, don't always choose to eat the specific insects you want. They eat whatever insects they can find. And this one here was staked out on a flower. It was blending in with the surrounding, so using its camouflage to hide it on the plant. As the butterfly came along to get that nectar reward from that flower, it reached out, grabbed it quickly, and inserted its mouth parts in it and is feeding on the butterfly. Um, as you can see from this picture here, they have very, very strong front legs that they use to immobilize their prey. And yes, this is going to sound a bit like from uh, some weird horror movie, but then their mouth part, because it's piercing sucking, is like a giant sharp straw that they inject into the body of the prey and then essentially suck the nutrients out of the animal they've captured. In this case, this butterfly here. Another example of this would be this bee assassin here, um, another predator species. Uh, they get called bee assassins because from time to time they will take a bee as its prey, uh, but they'll feed on a variety of things. Um, I actually, what that is that it's grabbed a hold and it's feeding on there. Um, but uh, so another good good insect out there working for you in your garden, going out and finding, hopefully, more pests than the things you want in your garden and, and keeping them in check. Um, so good insects to have in your yard. And as you can kind of see on this individual here, it's not using much camouflage. Uh, it will run out and grab its prey 
Um, the black and bright orange coloration is more of a warning to other things that stay away, you don't want to mess with me, um, it won't go your way. And especially in some of the tropical species of the assassin bugs, uh, they can pack a real nasty chemical punch um, that you don't want to mess with. Now, another true bug that kind of gets a bad rap but really doesn't do much is the box elder bug. The box elder bug, you know, it, it'll feed on tree species, box elder. You know, the name kind of says it all. Doesn't really do much damage, but they're more of a nuisance species late in the year. You'll find them on your house, uh, typically, especially if your house is a lighter color paint, because they're coming to that warmer surface. They're not harming anything. They're not doing anything. You can just allow them to be there. They'll go away. Actually, you can cause more problems for yourself if you try and remove them sometimes. Squishing them leaves a bit of a, a residue on the house, and hosing them just makes a mess. Um, just know they'll move away and wander off after a bit. They don't want to stay and hang out um, in the area. Another one of our true bugs is our cicadas. Now, cicadas are fascinating insects. We're going to talk about a couple different kinds of cicadas here real quick, but as you can see here, cicadas have a couple different stages. Over on the left, you can see the cicada's um, old case. So that is what the immature stage looks like that is underground feeding on the roots of the trees. And it would live underground. It would slowly suck nutrients from the tree, again, not causing any damage to the tree. And then in the summer months, they come crawling up out of the ground. And they look very alien-like as you see them erupting from the ground. It actually more reminds me of zombies coming up out of the ground than aliens coming up out of the ground because more zombies do that sort of thing. Zombies erupting out of the ground and they slowly lumber their way up onto the tree and then you watch as the adult cicada crawls out of its old skin out onto the tree um, and then they dry and harden. These things are like flying tanks. They're extremely heavy. You almost wonder how an individual like this can even get itself up off of the ground. Um, they fly okay, but man, if they run into you, it hurts. And uh, they're loud. I mean, in the summer months, you hear these things calling, and, and they can really fill the air um, with their call. Now, every once in a while, so the one we looked at were, were more the annual cicadas. Uh, we also have what we call the periodical cicadas. And it was just a couple, was it three years ago now? We had our brood come out here in Iowa. Well, one of the broods in Iowa, I guess, came out. And the photo here is from Ledges. And I had my youngest with me, and we were out collecting periodical cicadas. Now, the periodical cicadas are, are the black forms. Um, they can live underground for long periods of time. This was actually a 17-year cicada brood that was coming out. Uh, so a really, really long time as an imp. So not all insects... Their whole, not all insects have their lifespan within a short period of time. Some take a whole year for them complete, and some take several, several years, as is the case here. And what's really, really fascinating about cicadas is they're kind of tied to that tree. Wherever their eggs are laid, and they hatch out and drop to the ground, crawl underground, and start feeding on that tree's roots. These periodical cicadas are tied to that tree for 17 years. And if something happens to that tree, like it's cut down, and then the rootstock then is going to die, all of the cicadas that would be feeding on it will die as well. Um, it, it's what's interesting with these is they're so tied to a, a single tree for such a long period of time. So many things can go wrong, and yet... Over the many, many years, they persist. And there are different cicada broods all over the United States that come out at different years. And there are actually researchers who travel around the United States 
each year going to a different region of the United States trying to see that year's periodical cicadas. And there are just thousands of them, if you're in the right places, coming out of the ground. They have amazing numbers. And when they're calling, it's almost deafening. I mean, you can hear it for long distances, and it's so, so loud. And actually, what we were doing here, when we were so we were over at uh, Ledges State Park, um, picking them up and, and, and catching just volumes of them um, because there were so many. So it was just fun to gather up big numbers of them and, and put them all over, over the kids. All right, so moving into something a little smaller from our big, big cicadas. Um, but we're still in those true bugs. Uh, tree hoppers. So there's leaf hoppers and tree hoppers. They're both closely related. And uh, leaf hoppers are okay. They're tiny little slender guys. Uh, they come in different colors and shapes. But tree hoppers are the ones I wanted to focus on because they're a lot more fun. Um, similar in, in general form, but tree hoppers get more of the ornate structure. Uh, some of them look like thorns. So you can be looking at a thorny tree and and you're like, wait a second, that thorn just moved. And, and it's actually a thorn-shaped tree hopper. One time we got a, a shipment of plants from our suppliers in Florida that was shipped up to the gardens, and it had a thorn-shaped tree hopper on it. And at first nobody noticed them because it was a thorny tree. And then all of a sudden all the thorns started moving it when we were handling it, and we realized that they were a, uh, a non-native species of tree hoppers that were crawling all over all over the plants. And here's how interesting they can be. Um, some look like uh, they're leaves that could be on a tree, um, nodes on a tree. This one here is very bright and ornate, has beautiful color pattern on it. So I don't know about camouflage and blending in, but more scaring things off that it looks uh, big and kind of uh, scary with those big red eyes and that pointy red horn. Um, Again, typically a, it's a plant pest, but unless they're in really large numbers, they're not affecting the plant's growth. Um, they are a lot of fun to watch, and it is fun to watch them as, you know, hop around the plants and jump and skip and, and fly a bit um, as they move from part to part of the plant and you're chasing them. Now, aphids are another one that most of you gardeners are going to be like, oh, aphids, yes, I get them on all my plants. So we're not going to focus a lot on the aphids. Yes, they're pests. They come in different colors. They're feeding on your plants. Um, but let's jump over really quick to something fun that happens to aphids. So as you see true bugs under attack, I've titled this one. We're, we're jumping into a different group of insects, but this is the appropriate plate to show it off. So these are a parasitoid. They're a small wasp that attack aphids. And what's wonderful is it's kind of like an alien movie sort of thing. The wasp finds the aphids. So they pick up on chemical volatiles coming from the aphids feeding on the plants. They find them. They go there. The wasp stings the aphid, lays an egg inside. The aphid continues to eat and develop. And the immature wasp um, starts eating the aphid from the inside. The aphid continues to eat and grow, and then all of a sudden it stops eating. And the aphid's body starts swelling, as you can see in the picture there. And we call those mummies. And lo and behold, then one day, just like in the movie Alien, um, out erupts out of the body a new parasitic wasp. And so this is an example of biocontrol, where you've got an insect controlling another insect in the wild. And, and if given time, these wasps can completely control your aphid problems. So encouraging some of our native um, parasitic wasp to take out some of our pest species is a great way to go at it. Now, this is our last true bug, and it's not one you're going to find wandering around your garden. But for you water gardeners, this one is a lot of fun. So this is a water scorpion. Now, when you think scorpions, you think scorpions with big tails, and you're going to get stung by it. Um, these water scorpions use their tails essentially as a snorkel. So they sit at the water surface line. 
their tail goes up into the air and they actually breathe through it. Now at the other end, by the head there, they have kind of the raptoral legs that you would see on the praying mantis so that as small prey goes in front of them, uh, they can grab it. And again, they have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, so even things like tadpoles, small fish, these insects can feed on them. If you are a water gardener, you want these in your water garden. Um, they're gonna take out some of those pest species that are swimming around in there. They're a good um, general predator, um, but at the same time, they're too small to affect your fish. Uh, and it's always good when you're water gardening to think about the aquatic insects that are in there because they serve different roles, just like they do in your terrestrial garden. Um, it's important to think about aquatic insects in your water gardens. So you water gardeners, take a look for these. Um, they're, they're a lot of fun to, to get out. And when you pull them out of the water, they play dead. They pretend to just be a stick in your hand, and they really won't want to move um, while you're holding them out of water. So another good guy in your gardens, lace wings. So this is a green lace wing. There's brown lace wings. Um, they're green and brown. Uh, they are predators as both uh, adults and as immatures, and, and they will eat many of the pest species, your aphids um, and things like that, right off of your plants. So encouraging these in your garden is a good thing. Keep in mind, if you're using some sort of chemical control to control some of your pest species, it will affect these as well. Uh, so whenever possible, minimize, be very point specific when applying so that you're not affecting the beneficial insects. So now we're going to jump into um, some of our bigger groups. And, and I'm going to spend more time talking about specifics on some of these and less generalizing of the groups. Uh, our first one we're going to talk about is, for most of you, a pest. If you're growing tomatoes, potatoes, or tobacco, um, not as common these days in Iowa, but this is the tobacco hornworm here, not the tomato. They're closely related, though. Um, you, you may have seen this large green caterpillar eating your tomato plant. And yes, they will eat a lot of it, and they get very, very large. I mean... Caterpillars are essentially eating machines, and they eat lots and lots of plants. What I always like to say with something like this is, well, but what about the adults? I mean, these turn into the hummingbird moths or the sphinx moth, whichever common name you want to use, and there are some people who like to watch them flying around in the wild. Um, you can see on the, on the left side of this picture um, the pupa. Now... Butterfly chrysalids, or pupa, are often made and formed by a butterfly on a plant. This moth doesn't spin a silk cocoon, which is another thing some species will make around their pupa. This moth makes what we call a naked pupa, and they bury themselves in the ground. So it's really fun to watch, but they will actually, they'll form sitting on the ground. So the caterpillar will call to the ground and it will pupate by shedding its last larval molt. It'll, it'll molt that last skin and you'll have the pupa. And the pupa to bury itself in the ground then will gyrate itself in a certain um, direction that it will cause itself to go underground and kind of bury it itself. And then the next year in the spring it'll rotate in the opposite direction driving itself back up to the surface, at which time it will emerge. So, yes, on your tomato plants, these will eat a lot of your leaf matter. Um, sometimes they'll even eat the tomato plants. Just picking them off by hand is one of the easiest and best things you can do to control them. Or if you like to see the adults flying around um, in the evenings because they look a lot like hummingbirds, um, just plant a couple more tomatoes and let them have a little bit of your tomato plants. Now another insect that's been doing really well, another one of our butterflies, is the red admiral. And if you're out gardening, um, especially later in the day, um, this is one you'll probably see a lot of flying around. And I could spend a lot of time talking about a lot of butterflies, but I just chose two, or no, three, 
um, because I want to get through some of the other insects as well. I could spend all day just talking about the butterflies. But what makes red admirals a lot of fun is they're territorial. So you'll have males that'll set up territories in your backyard, in your gardens, and that's their territory. And as you're out there working, they'll come fly at you, they'll fly around you, they'll fly on you, they'll land near you because they're checking you out because you're in their territory. So it's almost like having your own pet butterfly while you're out there. So keep an eye out for these um, outside in the wild while you're out there. Now another butterfly that'll be in your garden potentially, and maybe you want it in your garden, is the black swallowtail. As caterpillars, these things feed on parsley, dill, fennel, carrot tops, a variety of those types of things you would plant in your garden. Now, I was doing a program one time. I had an individual raise her hand. She goes, I've got these green and black and yellow worms, and they keep eating my parsley. And I go, well, what do you do with those worms? And she goes, well, I squish them, of course. So I asked her, and I go, do you know the black swallowtail? She goes, oh, I love the black swallowtail. I have so many of them flying around in my yard. And I just looked at her and I go, so those worms were actually caterpillars of the black swallowtail. And she turned like three shades of white. Um, I'm not sure, but I don't think she'll ever kill any insect in her yard ever again. So this is just a good case to really know your insects in your yard because you never quite know what it is you might be uh, removing. It may actually turn out that at another stage of its life, it's actually something that you want to have around. Now, this isn't an insect that you're typically going to find in your yard, but I'm pushing it. Um, it's awareness because I think this should be our official state butterfly. So this is the Regal Fritillary. As a tiny, tiny little caterpillar, it survives our Iowa winters. So there's only one generation a year. The females lay their eggs in the fall in typically tall grass prairie. Why well, you're not going to find it in your backyard for most of us. Um, the caterpillar eats its egg and then nothing else until the next fall or the next spring when the host plant, which is the prairie violet and bird foot violet, emerges from the ground. So this tiny, tiny little caterpillar um, has to survive our Iowa winter. So unlike something like the monarch who flies south and spends his time in Mexico, you know, enjoying their warmer winters um, than here, these overwinter as essentially little bitty kids um, in our tall grass prairie. And then in the springtime, you'll see the males and females flying around until early summer. And then the males die off. And then the females have to survive our hot, dry Iowa summers until the fall when they can finally lay their eggs again. So fascinating, fascinating butterfly that has a real strong tie to our native Iowa plant heritage. Now, some things you can do to get involved with butterflies in the wild um, we actually created at Iowa State an app called the Unified Butterfly Recorder. We work with students in the computer and electrical engineering um, department, and they created us these apps that you can download for your Android or iOS devices. And you can go out in the field, you can record the butterflies you see, and it'll even make maps of where you've seen the butterflies. The Android version is done right now. The iOS version should be done by the end of May. Um, it's actually done. It's just not on the uh, the Play Store currently. So, or not the Play Store. Theirs is the App Store. Android is the Play Store. So look for that real soon um, in a uh, App Store near you. Another program we run at Ryman Gardens is called the Iowa Butterfly Survey Network. We train citizen scientists to go out in the field and survey butterfly populations. And every year in the spring, we have these trainings. And if you go to the website at the bottom down here, you can see when um, an upcoming training will be happening in your area or when the one is at Ryman Gardens. There's not enough professionals, you know, actual paid field biologists to do all the surveying we need to know what's going on annually with our butterflies. So by getting volunteers across the state on different sites, we can really get a good picture of what's going on in the state. 
And in your backyards right now, um, a project you can cre uh, participate in that's done by the Blank Park Zoo is called Plant Grow Fly. And what they're trying to do is to get individuals to get involved with planting plants for our butterflies. And you can go there, you can register your garden, and it's really simple and easy. And all you need to register your garden is one host plant and one nectar plant, and you've got a plant grow fly garden. Now the hope is you'll plant a lot more plants for our native pollinators, um, but only one is needed to certify your garden. So if you just go to plantgrowfly.com, um, it'll take you to the plant grow fly site. Now there's lots of programs that are doing this sort of thing, and Plant Grow Fly will send you a little sign you can put in your garden. Um, but it's getting a little carried away right now from all the different groups that are trying to convince people to go out and plant pollinator and butterfly-friendly gardens, and each one has a sign you can put out in your garden. You can almost, almost now have more signs than um, possibly different species of, of plants for those pollinators in your gardens. Um, it's getting a little silly. So another great resource, um, and I've put it in this spot, but it could have gone in a lot of places, is a relatively new website, or at least a redone website, called Insects of Iowa. And it's at insectsofiowa.org. And one, it's a great place to go to see images of your different insects, although Jim Durbin, who runs it, is interested in lots of stuff. So you can see Iowa birds, you can see amphibians, you can see lots of stuff there. Uh, but he has wonderful, wonderful images. And on this new version of his website, you can actually go and see records. So you can type in the name of an insect, and it will show you the records at least he has of where it was found in the state and when. And if you want to submit records to a site like this, I mean, if it's not something that has its own web page where you've been able to find, but it's an insect you're interested in, you know, it's wasp or it's some sort of beetle, he'll take all your records and they'll be stored here and other people can access them. So it's wonderful that here in the state, we're starting to get more of these tools that are developed just for us um, that we can use to better identify, to better track, to find these different insects across the state. Um, so I recommend the use of this one. All right, so we're going to move from butterflies. As I said, I could talk about butterflies all day long. I could probably spend a lot of time on beetles because there's lots of fun beetles as well. But I let off one that you're all like, uh, Japanese beetles, those aren't fun beetles. Don't worry, we won't spend much time here. So these, yes, are a pest species, um, an introduced species that has moved across most of the United States now and has caused lots and lots of damage on different plants. The bonus is, is they're finally starting to settle down. I mean, there was a time that they would strip trees down to nothing. Those trees have now been removed and planted with different plants and other Beneficials, other predators are starting to eat these. And while, yes, they still have large numbers, um, they become a lot more manageable um, in the sense that they're not completely stripping plants anymore and going out and hand removing them um, into buckets of soapy water and things like that. Um, it, you can actually manage them a bit and not result in chemical spray. So on to some more exciting and happy beetles because there are plenty of beetles outside of Japanese beetles. Don't let this one species give the rest of them a bad name. Caterpillar hunters. <laughs> These are a lot of fun. Um, they are ferocious, ferocious hunters. And they're really cool looking. I mean, there's some metallic green. They kind of have purple legs. And when you see these scurrying across the ground, you know they're after something. Um, this is one that you could actually keep as a pet. And then as you find those pesky pest species in your gardens, pluck them off, feed them to them, and they will gobble them up for you. Um, they spend a lot of time in trees. So they will come down out of the trees, and you can see them running into your gardens. Uh, but if you have some, some nice trees, they're possibly up there running around, eating your caterpillars out of your trees. Blister beetles! 
Yes, they can cause blisters on you. They have a chemical secretion, so it makes them cool. Also, why you want to respect and not handle them, um, they create a chemical secretion that will cause blisters on your hands. Uh, they can cause problems for livestock. If you had a large infestation of these and the livestock was eating them, they can cause digestional problems for the livestock. Um, this is where... It's fun to play with beetles, but again, knowing what you're playing with can really play in your favor because if you were to handle one of these, um, it wouldn't go well for you. Um, they can really cause some irritation to your skin. But if you leave them alone, they're beautiful to look at. They come in different colors, um, but they, for the most part, have this very characteristic shape here. So very kind of slender to the head and big as you come to the end of the abdomen. Um, sometimes it's even round at the end of the abdomen. So you can kind of identify them from this general shape here. The lady beetle. So this is one that most people enjoy. Unfortunately, due to the introduction of the Asian lady beetle, which is different than this one here, the convergent lady beetle, they're different species, they have different behaviors, this isn't typically the one that you find in your home, the Asian lady beetle is the one that comes in your home and you find them all winter long and people are vacuuming them up and annoyed with them, but ladybugs are a good insect, they are a generalist predator, they eat lots and lots of things, and no, they don't come in these colors, I made this artsy. Um, it's an, a photo I took and, and used, and I, I made it more fun and added a little engagement to them. Um, but So that's why the colors. They're not really those colors. Um, these individuals here are a beneficial. Um, these were from a biocontrol company that you can buy. They'll ship these across. You can put them in your garden, and they'll eat your pests um, in there. Now, keep in mind, when you put these in your garden, you get like a pint of them. You put them out and their first instinct is to fly away. So buying these from those garden cal uh, catalogs, um, while it's something you can do, uh, really you're going to be putting ladybugs on everyone else's gardens because only a small percentage is going to typically stay around in yours. Um, there are lots of species that are native to Iowa. And when I was a college student many, many years ago here at Iowa State, I found my one and only twice stabbed lady beetle. They're an all black individual, as you can see, and they have the two red dots. It looks like they were stabbed on both sides. And uh, these are, are harder and harder to find. A lot of these non native lady beetles are out competing them. These species are becoming hard to find. And another way you can get involved with lady beetles is there is a group, the Lost Ladybug Project. And they're asking for citizen scientists to take photos of and submit. And they have keys that help you identify your lady beetles, but they'll also identify the photos that you submit to them. Um, so a wonderful project to do with kids, um, for adults to use, and it gives us really good information to help advance our understanding of how these populations are doing. So some other beetles. Uh, the June beetle and the northern mass chafer are two that you'll see running around a lot at your homes. Um, these are great beetles to give to kids to play with because there's lots of them. They're typically a pest species. They're not going to harm any kids. You can give them whole handfuls of them. They can crawl all over them. Um, my four children love to play with these. They're easy to collect because at night they're attracted to lights and you can go out there in the morning and just find them sitting on the ground, sitting up on the house. Um, yes, as grubs, these are a pest species, they, uh, they will, uh, basically they are underground feeding on your grass's roots. Um, so typically they're one that people will be treating for. Um, <clears throat> so seeing adults flying around isn't something that's good for you if you're trying to maintain their grubs in your ground. Now onto a beetle that people don't often think of as a beetle, but is a spectacular individual, and most people love to see this beetle. It's the lightning bug or the firefly. So... Here's an insect that actually has bioluminescence in its body, the ability to flash. 
And that's how they communicate with each other. As they're flying around for males and females to find each other, they have specific flashing patterns that they do to where they will make, say, a backwards J so that they can identify the species. Um, what's fun is there are some female species that will actually flash a different uh, male, a different flashing pattern for a different female. When a male comes down to then potentially mate with that female, that female eats him. He's from a different species. Lightning bugs are predators, and they just gobble them up. Now, I'm hoping that on your screens you can see as well as I can. Uh, this was actually a shot I took at night using long exposure. And you can see the lightning bug flash patterns um, that they were making when I was doing the long exposure. It's If you're a photographer and a gardener, which a lot of gardeners take photos of their stuff, try going out at night when the lightning bugs are flashing. Do long exposures on it, and you can get some really, really fun images um, of them. And lightning bugs also have their own um, project right now where you can submit lightning bug firefly observations um, to the site and I checked this year for 2016 no lightning bug sightings have been made for Iowa yet so you could be the first to put that pin in the state of Iowa um, this site is hosted out of the Museum of Science at Boston um, so look them up and get on and, and submit some of your sightings now, this is really found in Iowa. So, just as you can see, I, I actually went to the Insects of Iowa site and I grabbed the records for these dung beetles. So, this is a dung beetle, the splendid dung beetle. They are a beautiful metallic green dung beetle, and they're quite large. And dung beetles are great because they gather up dung, roll it in a ball, put their eggs inside, and their offspring feed on it. So if you've got um, an area where you can find some of these dung beetles, typically they're going to more livestock. Um, you need to be looking for livestock that isn't wormed because if it's wormed, the uh, dung is actually poisonous then for the dung beetles. Uh, but, but if you can find these around the state, they're a lot of fun um, to watch working the dung, rolling it as a pear, turning it into a ball, burying it underground, and then um, as they lay their eggs inside. Um, so dung beetles are, are, are one that has a wonderful behavior and are fun to watch. Click beetles. Now, this is one of the largest in Iowa, the eyed click beetle. Uh, they're a lot of fun because you can, if you flip them over to turn themselves back over, they will actually s kind of make their body make a snap, and they will pop and twist over. And, and it does make a very loud click when they do it. Uh, so... They're, they're a lot of fun to play with. You may find them in your gardens eating some of your pollen. They're not really harming the plant. They're just there to, after the pollen um, that they enjoy to feed on. Now, another individual that will eat your pollen and is in pretty good numbers across the state is the soldier beetles. Soldier beetles are not a full-on pest. They're just kind of in your gardens. Um, they're not doing a lot of obvious damage to the plants again they're more after the pollen rewards um, and as pollinators beetles as a whole while they do pollination work aren't the greatest pollinators typically bees are considered to be much better pollinators because beetles are messy pollinators they like the flowers of these large dinner plates and as they go to eat the pollen they get the pollen all over their body and when they walk from one plant to the next plant um, it gets carried around so don't worry about the the soldier beetles running around in your yards they're they're not they're not harming anything um, they're just out there looking to eat some of your pollen so we have our tiger beetles tiger beetles are a great predator um, they're extremely fast uh, they're fun to watch and they come in different colors and patterns uh, possibly my favorite is the metallic green tiger beetles. I mean, the sun, as it comes off of them, it just sparkles that emerald green color. Uh, one of the funnest things to do with tiger beetles is just to see if you can catch them. 
they have to be like the Houdini of the Beatles when it goes to grabbing them. Just when you think with net or your hand that you've got one, you go to drop on it and you move your hands and they have vanished. They are extremely fast runners and they can take flight when they need to to get away. Um, and, and one of the reasons that they're so good at catching their prey is because of that ability to run and fly and kind of drop in on it. Um, but they truly are like a tiger pouncing um, when they're on the hunt. And, and they are a lot of fun to try and catch. And they have this amazing immature grub that kind of hangs out in these holes in the ground. And as potential prey walks by, they spring out, grab their prey, and then drop back into their holes. Kind of like a jack-in-the-box. Um, it's extremely fast. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to actually see without just going onto YouTube and pulling it up. And, and that's what I would recommend because finding their little holes is, is nearly impossible. Um, but, but pull up a YouTube video, watch them attack their prey. They are a lot of fun. And then another one of our beetles. Right now, planting milkweed has become very popular. We're trying to help the monarchs. The more milkweed we have out there, the better. But with the more milkweed, a beetle that you see on it a lot is the milkweed beetle. And here's one that's uh, actually getting ready to take flight. And this photo allows me to show you that while beetles have that hard kind of wing covering, that, that acts as one of their two sets of wings, underneath folded up is their second pair of wings that they actually use for flight. Um, so our beetles can fly, they do take flight, and one of their wings is folded up underneath the other modified wing. This is the sumac flea beetle. It's a pest species, it's eating the leaves. But the reason that I put it in here is because of their grubs. So the grub is the photo on the right. And they have an interesting way in which they defend themselves from potential predators. They actually take their frass, again, that's the fancy word for insect poop, and they put it on their backs. So you can see up by the head there that dark black structures that is piles of frass on its back. And if they're undisturbed and it hasn't rained a bunch, um, they can actually have the frass all across their back. That's one way to defend yourself from being eaten from predators. And our final beetle that we're going to talk about is actually a weevil. Weevils are easy to identify. They have these long snouts um, that allows them to kind of poke their mouth parts into their food. Um, gr stored grains can be uh, attacked by weevils quite often. But weevils are just cute. They're like gonzo. Um, they have that long snout. So they're an easy to identify uh, group of insects. Um, so as you're out and about, oh look, it's a weevil. It's one of those nice things like monarch. Oh look, it's a monarch. Most everyone can identify a monarch from its identifiable um, physical traits into flies flies often get a bad rap um, here's a photo of a house fly and uh, one time you don't think of flies so this was actually taken outside early in the morning when the fly was covered with dew um, another fun time to go out and observe insects is early in the morning when they haven't gone up and moving and you can take some really fun pictures of them as they're sitting there house flies they're more a nuisance. They're not causing a lot of problems. They have sponging mouth parts, so they just kind of lap up where they get in a trouble is when they land on our food. And to sponge up things, they have to regurgitate onto the item to suck it back up. But they're only one fly. And yes, now I'm showing another pest species of a fly, the mosquito. And we all know why they're a pest. Um, they feed on us is typically the problem. And they can spread different diseases as well. Um, but mosquitoes need to eat as well. And it's the females that are feeding on us. The males are nectar feeders and are not feeding on us, but the females are using the blood meal to help feed their offspring. So let's get away from, uh, from mosquitoes and go to something that often confuses people as a giant mosquito, which is our crane flies. Crane flies aren't going to hurt anyone. They're not giant mosquitoes. They're actually very docile and fragile. 
Um, if you ever try to pick up a crane fly, you will often break off one of their many legs. Um, they are extremely fragile. You see them oftentimes sitting on houses, um, but they're just off zipping around, going about their business. And yes, while they're a large fly and they look like a mosquito, they are not a mosquito. They cannot bite you. There is no reason to swat every one of them that you see. Now, one fly that can defend itself like no other fly is the horse fly. This is a fast, aggressive fly. Um, to feed on us and other mammals, uh, they actually have a ripping, tearing mouth part. And that is why a horsefly bite hurts so much is because they're actually ripping your scalp when they're feeding on you. And they're lapping up then the juices that um, come by afterwards. Um, so here's one fly that you can be fascinated by because of how it feeds and at the same time not want them coming to bother you. Now this is one that gets found in um, homes sometimes, in industrial areas, the moth fly. It actually looks like a moth. It has kind of a fluffy body. It has wings that look like a moth, but it is a tiny, tiny fly that as an immature, as a, as a maggot, feeds in very organic-based, um, oh, let's just call it goo. Let's just call it goo. They like to live in drains, um, in muck, um, and they, they feed on that, and they break that organic matter down. So they're good for us as adults. They're not doing much. They're just hanging out. Now some good guys that you want to see flying around in your gardens, that you want around your house, are things like these robber flies. And they're called robber flies because they rob the lives of other insects. This is a predator fly. Now this is actually two. This is a male and female, and they're mating in this photo. Um, but you can kind of see on their heads that, that mouth part that they would use to consume their prey. Um, so this is a, a predatory species that eats flies. Um, it'll eat lots and lots of different species and they're good to see flying around and they're fun to watch oh watching them hunt is is really a pleasure so if you can find some of these in your yard keep an eye on them and watch them grab those pesky mosquitoes and flies that are bothering you while you're gardening now this final is, is a really good segue into our final group we're going to talk about we've got the flies on the right we've got our bees on the left and we have that confused individual sitting in the middle that's one of our, our surfid flies. It's a fly, but it is a bee mimic. So it's using the coloration, the yellows and blacks, to look like um, one of our bee species so that things will leave it alone and won't try and eat it. But at the same time, it is a fly that is not going to be able to sting or hurt anything. It is a tasty, tasty treat to our predators. So starting out in our final group, We've got our ants. So ants and bees and wasp all go together. Uh, our ants don't have wings except for the reproductives. So our male and female reproductives before we get to our workers, um, they would have wings for a bit. The drones would, the males would mate with the females. The males typically die. The female, when the queen lands, she eats her wings and then off her wings go. And then none of her workers will have wings. All of our ants are females that you see running around working. And in this image here, ants have wonderful behaviors. And we could just talk about ants and ant behavior. And E.O. Wilson has written many a books and so have many other people on ants and what they do and how they communicate. But this group of ants in this photo here is actually tending those aphids. They are going to them. The aphids, as they're feeding on the plants, are excreting um, honeydew which is a surgery solution, and they are feeding on it as their food source. Um, so there's lots of things you can do with watching ants. Ants are fascinating individuals. Now, while this looks like an ant, um, this isn't an ant that you would want to pick up, and it's not an ant at all. This is one of our velvet ants, which is actually a wingless wasp. So it can sting, and they pack quite a punch. The males of the velvet ants do have wings and fly around, but the females are wingless, and they're a, a solitary wasp. So they're a ground dweller. They run around um, on the ground, and they're usually these bright colors. 
So you'll see what looks like a really bright ant running along the ground all by itself with no one following it. Um, and, and they often kind of bounce their abdomen like you see wasps do a lot as they're running around. Um, if you were to grab one of these, they can pack a pretty nasty sting with um, their stingers. Now moving into our wasp of flight. So this one's very appropriately named. Um, and the reason I brought this one up is kind of coming back around to the milkweed plants again. With all the planting people are doing of milkweed, um, the great black wasp also likes a lot of those flowering milkweed plants. And you will be seeing a lot of those on your plants. As long as you don't mess with them, they won't mess with you. Um, so don't be concerned when you see these large individuals on your milkweed plants. Um, at Ryman Gardens, we have one of the uh, milkweed test plots out there and we were finding more of these wasps than we were finding butterflies and caterpillars on the plants. Now some of our wasps have very specialized organs. Um, this is one of the uh, parasitic wasp. It has a very long special shaped abdomen that it would use to actually oviposit its eggs into grubs that would be in trees. So in the, the bores, it would be way into the trees. It would stick its long abdomen in there, sting it, lay an egg inside of it. Um, so sometimes just looking at the amazing structure that some of these wasps have um, can be a lot of fun. Now, this is a species you may find in your gardens. This is our cicada killer. They are monsters. They are huge. This is actually a male and female. The female is the larger of the two. The male is sitting on her back there. Cicada killers will dig a bunch of holes in uh, rock walls, in the ground, and they will go out and find prey. Typically, they're looking for giant cicadas that they will pack in there. They will lay their eggs, and then their offspring will feed on the eggs. They're a fairly, while they're big and menacing looking, they're a fairly docile wasp. And there is no reason to take action on these um, and, and really watch them go in and out of their nest. Watch them bring back these giant cicadas, which are bigger than they are, flying through the air. Um, but they are a great, great insect to, to really watch their behaviors. Now, yes, the paper nest wasp, when they make their nest by your front door, is a bad thing. But these are predators. These wasps eat lots and lots of insects. So having them around is a good thing. And if you build, like the photo we've got in the upper right there, a wasp box, essentially it's, it's a cube with an open bottom, and the wasp will actually use that to make their nest in instead of making them on your eaves. And then you can just leave them be. And if you leave them alone and don't mess with their nest, they'll leave you alone. But yes, if they build a nest by your garage, door or your house door, um, you'll typically need to remove them um, and sooner than later because the longer you wait, the larger the nest will be, the more wasps there will be and the more aggressive they'll become. Now moving from our wasp into our bees, um, our mason bees are wonderful individuals. These tiny little insects, for the most part, can't sting. Um, so you don't have to worry about them stinging. And when colony collapse disorder became real popular, it was these individuals that they were looking at as being the thing that was going to take over a lot of the pollination work that was going to happen in our almond fields and, and other large scale production crops like that. And they're one species that you can actually do something for in your backyard. Um, you can build these mason bee or orchard bee homes and you can find lots of plans online for it. Um, but essentially they're blocks of wood, holes in the blocks of wood of different varying sizes depending on the species you want to attract and they will come and they will make their nest inside and they really do a lot of early season um, pollination work so if you've got uh, apple trees and, and some of those other tree species especially they're a great individual to have out working in your garden right alongside you I put our sweat bees in just because they're fun and cute. They're a tiny little bee. And yes, sometimes they sting when you get a little too close or accidentally sit on one, put your hand on one out in the garden. Um, but they're cute, shiny little guys. I mean, this metallic coloration sparkles in the sun. It's just fascinating to see. Um, but they're fun to watch as they're visiting your flowers. 
are honeybees. Honeybees get talked about a lot. They're one of our pollinator workhorses. And and we all like to see the pollination happening that the honeybees are doing. Beekeepers um, have run into some problems lately with the colony collapse disorder. So anything we can do to promote um, having more pollen and nectar for our honeybees that is chemical-free um, is, is really a great thing to do. Now I want to spend some extra time on these, though, our bumblebees. Bumblebees get overlooked. Bumblebees are a wonderful bee. They are not all that aggressive. I like to think of them as the kitty cats of the bee world. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can actually pet them. They're so soft and fuzzy and docile. Uh, and if you're doing things like growing a lot of tomatoes, um, these are one that you want around. Honeybees don't typically go to tomatoes. Bumblebees will. And by having them around, you can actually increase your tomato production. It's possible to create bumblebee boxes. And again, going online, you can just type in bumblebee houses. And there's lots of resources for how to make a bumblebee box. You can also buy bumblebee boxes, nest, that you can have in your yard. And really what these are really for, though, is more for the greenhouse industry. And they put them out in um, their glass houses with their tomatoes. The bumblebees are working the tomatoes right alongside the workers. Um, and very few conflicts arise. There is a citizen science project called Bee Spotter where you can submit your bumblebees you're seeing. We have several different species of bumblebees in Iowa and across the United States, and several of them we think their population, well, we know their populations are declining, but we don't know how well they're doing in, you know, from one spot to the next. And you, again, can get involved observing the species you've got outside. And our final bee species today, just because they're so blasted cute, is the squash bees. This is another solitary bee. Unlike the bumblebees and the honeybees, which just work together in a collective, these squash bees are more solitary. And if you're growing squashes, uh, every once in a while, you'll see these bees that'll go in there. The squash bees will actually spend the night in these flowers. Um, and I think they look so cute if you look at this picture here. Um, I caught this individual that just crawled in there, which is kind of hanging out in there, visiting the plant probably hiding because I think it was getting warm that day. So keep an eye out for these squash bees. Um, they're a lot of fun to see flying around. Now, as I've been trying to push this whole time, here in Iowa, we need more people getting involved with insects. And I've given you a bunch of different resources that you can use. Um, an activity that you can participate in, each year at Ryman Gardens, we host an event called Day of Insects. And next year's Day of Insects will be on March 25th. We bring in 15 speakers from all over, um, but we've got academics, enthusiasts, professionals, researchers, um, and the day truly is for everyone. Uh, we have, again, all those groups I just mentioned and kids that come and listen to these different programs from these people who really, truly enjoy and are passionate about insects. Uh, so consider participating in a day of insects next year and with that i'd like to thank you for participating in today's lecture my email address is on the slide there and if you have any questions i would be happy to answer them for you have a wonderful day everyone thank you thank you so much nathan for that discussion of insects i wanted to pause briefly so that we could make time for a discussion we have a couple questions for you to discuss in your small groups. The first one is, which resources shared here will you use? And the second question is, what will you do to increase insect awareness in your community? Please feel free to take five minutes to explore these questions. <laughs> 